crashed there for all four planes that have been confirmed as being hijacked over U.S. skies today. Again, two crashing into the World Trade Center towers, one into the Pentagon, and this last one, you see the debris of it there in the agricultural area, the farming areas, the rolling hills of Pennsylvania. I want to now try to show you some live pictures now of lower Manhattan at this hour. Again, you still see a thick plume of smoke there. Aaron Brown standing by again in his vantage point on a rooftop in New York City now. Aaron, what are you seeing? Joey, thank you. We can see, as uh, our viewers can see, the smoke continues to billow out of the Trade Center buildings six hours, more than six hours after the planes hit. 50,000 people going to work in those buildings. We're joined now on the phone by former Secretary of State James Baker and former Defense Secretary William Cohen. Mr. Baker, let me uh, begin with you. You've been involved in some extraordinary events in the course of your government service. Can you give us any sense at all of what you expect it is like in the Situation Room right now? Well, I'm sure that it's uh, extraordinarily busy, been, and uh, it is a very, it's really a very sorrowful uh, day for our country. We've lost uh, many, many innocent civilians to what is what can only be characterized as a very dastardly and cowardly act. A terribly tragic day uh, for America. But I, I really sense, uh, Aaron, that we are, we may be entering a, a, a bit of a new era, an era where uh, we have been uh, worried in the past about uh, terrorism against America. We've always been able to handle it. We obviously were not in a position to handle it today. We do not know all the facts, uh, but we can, uh, we can uh, I, I think, suppose and uh, surmise a few things. And, and one of those is that it, it took a fairly, uh, I think, sophisticated and, and uh, complicated uh, planning apparatus to, to plan and carry out these events. And uh, Secretary Cohn, uh, not a lot of groups in the world would be capable of this degree of sophistication, would have the financing, the wherewithal to pull this off, would they? I think that's correct. Uh, we don't know at this point exactly which group it is, but uh, there, there aren't many that would have this uh, degree of uh, sophistication, ability to calibrate it so that you'd have nearly simultaneous attacks on uh, three important uh, symbols and sites in the United States. And sir, when we talk about not very many, are we talking about a handful, three or four, a dozen? What do we mean? I think we're talking about a handful of groups uh, that would have this uh, capability. Again, we don't know all the facts yet in terms of how they were able to uh, gain access to the aircraft, what sort of weapons they had on board. Uh, much of that information uh, hopefully will become forthcoming uh, in the next uh, few weeks. But uh, uh, at this point, we simply have to uh, gather all the information we can to make sure that we can carry out uh, President Bush's uh, vow uh, to hunt down and punish those responsible for this, uh, what Jim Baker just said, dastardly act. Uh, there are a few acts in our history that uh, certainly measure up to the magnitude of the, the loss of life and uh, what it means to this country, and I think that Jim Baker had it right. Uh, we're entering a new period, and it's going to cause us to focus um, uh, our efforts in terms of reconciling what kind of uh, society we can continue to have where we have uh, a persistent uh, threat against innocent civilians in a democratic society, we're going to have to engage in a very constructive and intense debate on how we measure the, uh, the trade-offs between protecting our people and protecting our civil liberties. And that's a debate that has uh, yet to begin in earnest, but I'm sure that it will. We, uh, we now know that the president uh, is in Nebraska that he's uh, that he is Sarasota, Florida this morning where he was to give a speech on education to Louisiana he's now in Nebraska participating in a national security briefing uh, former Secretary of State George Schultz is with us as well uh, Mr. Secretary I assume that most of the conversation is going from Washington to the president what are they telling him would you guess I don't know what we're telling him, but I know how I feel about this. First of all, there has been an act of war of the worst kind, namely against civilians, designed to disrupt and uh, demoralize civilian life, as well as an act of war against the Pentagon. We know that this was carried out 
by an organization big enough to do something rather complex and complicated. So we have to know who those people are and we have to go after them, but we have to do more than that. On the one hand, we have to learn what's coming and preempt it and not be afraid to preempt potential terrorist acts against us. But then we have to look to our own security and give ourselves the kind of reassurance that we deserve, that we're doing the things necessary so we uh, have our children back to our schools, our government officials back in their offices, and uh, these people are not able to stop a resilient, powerful, strong country as we are. Mr. Schultz, you said we ought not be afraid to preempt it. Have we been afraid to preempt it? It's hard to preempt. No, well, we've done some in the past. It's hard to preempt because you have to know who it is you're going after very clearly and have the right kind of intelligence. But it only underlines the importance of uh, strong intelligence, not only uh, electronic intelligence and photography and so on, but we have to have a very capable human intelligence to know uh, and be able to preempt these sorts of things. Uh, uh, Secretary Cohn, you were in office, as, if memory serves me correctly, when the coal was attacked. Uh, obviously, this is a much uh, more horrific event. Did the coal incident flash back in your mind? It flashed back in my mind, but also the, um, the bombings in East Africa uh, yeah. flashed even yeah, more vividly uh, before me because they were, again, nearly simultaneous explosions uh, directed against innocent civilians. And to follow up on Secretary Schultz just mentioned, we indeed, uh, we indeed did uh, gather together and vow uh, to uh, have the long arm of justice reach out and, uh, and track those down who are responsible for it, but we also took preemptive action. That was the basis uh, on our attack in Afghanistan when we had intelligence that there was to be a gathering. Well, we're obviously having a lot of crosstalk and a uh, technical problem. We'll sort it out and we'll try and, uh, and get our guests back. We mentioned a moment ago there were 50,000 people who come to work each day at the World Trade Center. There are literally tens of thousands more who come into the city, uh, each of them affected. But the effect of this, uh, we suspect, will is much broader than that, that it will affect everyone in the country. Former Secretary of State George Shultz says American life been changed, I know forever seems a bit farther than I want to go, but American life been changed today? No. American life will pick up. We have to uh, look to our security, obviously, and be careful about it, but we're not going to allow these terrible people to change our way of life. They just aren't going to be able to do it. We defend ourselves adequately. We will find out who they are, we will get rid of them, and we'll learn how to preempt these attacks. But we're not going to change our way of life because of these people. I reject that entirely. And so we respond and then people get on airplanes again with the same sense of security that they had before. People go to the Trade Center with the same sense of security they had before. I'm afraid it'll be a while before they go to the Trade Center, but yeah. as far as the use of uh, commercial aircraft are concerned, yes, I think we'll have our aircraft back in operation. We'll have to have uh, tighten and be very careful uh, as uh, people get on these planes so that we feel secure that we've done everything uh, possible to keep people off who uh, obviously took over a plane. They did it very skillfully. The pilots apparently weren't able to put out any kind of an SOS and they must have been able to fly the plane. So um, we're dealing with an organized group. They have to have a safe haven somewhere that allows them to do these things. <clears throat> so let's go, go after them. Uh, Mr. Secretary, thanks for joining us today.
Secretary of State, former Secretary of State George Shultz, James Baker, former Secretary of State as well, and uh, Secretary of the Treasury, uh, and William Cohn, former Senator from Maine and Secretary of Defense in the Clinton administration, all joining in and all uh, offering similar messages that what happened today cannot be allowed to change the basic core of American life and that the United States must hold accountable and responsible not simply those who carried out these actions in New York and in Washington uh, and perhaps another plane as well, the plane that crashed in Pittsburgh, but also any government uh, that has turned a blind eye to terrorist groups that has offered them safe haven or support, financial, physical support, whatever, that they must be held accountable as well. Um, James Kallstrom, uh, former uh, FBI uh, here in New York, joins us. He's in Delaware. Uh, Mr. Kallstrom, can you hear me? I can hear you fine. Uh, what, what are you hearing? Are you hearing things now? Do you have a network of people who are, who are calling in or that you're calling who are telling you what they're finding out? Well, I certainly have a network of friends, then, and they're busy doing their work, not calling me. Uh, the only people calling me right now are the news media. Okay. Um, what's going through your mind? What, what are the questions beyond the most obvious? Who did this? What is it that you want to know? First off, uh, just the immense tragedy of this event and the desire to save as many people as we can save in this terrible, terrible situation. Uh, second thought is that you know, since 93, with the bombing of the World Trade Center the first time, uh, people that hate us and hate what we stand for and hate our way of life have demonstrated that over and over again. Uh, I don't have to go through all the different events, but we all know what they are. And today, they've brought that terrible hatred uh, to the United States of America. And we, as a country, as a nation, need to stand together. I, agree totally with Judge Schultz, who I admire tremendously, uh, that we need to go find out who these people are. And with respect to collateral damage, we need to not let this happen again. And I think this puts about five exclamation points on why we in this country need a sophisticated, dedicated, high morale team of intelligence agencies and law enforcement that work together. Uh, not that that, if it was any better than it, it was the last five years, I'm not saying it wasn't good, but it needs to be the best and continue to be the best. But you're suggesting it, hasn't, it has not been good enough. Well, in a free society, you know, it's virtually impossible to know everything about every bunch of cowards and crazy people that populate the world, unfortunately. Uh, but we need to get as close to that as possible without changing our way of life. And I think and that, that exclamation point it just hits home today. Uh, and we need to stop this. We need not to change our way of life. We need to find out who did this. And I'll tell you right now, that's a short list of people. And uh, our government knows pretty much what that short list is. They're putting the final touches, I'm sure, uh, and will over the course of the next few hours next few days uh, and we need to do something about it sir thank you for your time today appreciate joining uh, thank you. we have we have shown you a number of times the video of this second plane that at 908 uh, hit the trade center we have i believe some still pictures of that plane as it moved i'm seeing them for the first time with you so bear with us uh, you can see that in the first shot the plane approaching the trade center And here in the second frame, you, you can see in the front, I believe what we saw there was the, the plumes of smoke and fire from the, from, the first, uh, from the hit on the first building. The plane now visibly closer, visibly closer to, uh, to uh, the Trade Center building. It, it is just the most extraordinary and painful thing to look at because you know what's happening. Mr. Kalstrom, are you able to see these pictures, by the way? Mr. Kalstrom? Yes, I am. Were you able to see those? I was able to see that, yes. 
as you watch that, as you've seen that, I hear it, it, the anger builds, doesn't it? Uh, it does. It certainly does build. I mean, it's unbelievable. It's unbelievable. I mean, we're trained in many ways, both of us, uh, by profession, not to use words like unbelievable. And then you confront moments like this where, in fact, unbelievable is about the only word that seems to apply. Uh, yeah, I just can't, uh, having lived through the tragedy of TWA Flight 800, which as sad as that was, I mean, this is geometrically worse. And just thinking about the personal terror of all the people involved in this, the people on those planes. I'm sure there's teenagers and babies and adults and just normal people on those airplanes that, that suffered tremendous terrorism. It, uh, it, it, yes, sir, it is hard to imagine what it must have been like on those four airplanes because while the attacks on the, excuse me, on the buildings themselves happened quite quickly, these people in these airplanes were aware that something horrible was happening for perhaps an hour, the flight from Boston to New York, right around an hour, a little bit less. Uh, clearly, they knew this was something horrible was, had, had come into their lives. That's and they knew it for a long time. That's probably true. And think about the fact that, that people obviously took control of the plane and knew something about flying one of these sophisticated fly-by-wire airplanes. I don't know how much they knew. They knew enough, obviously, to crash it into the building. I can't imagine any American pilot crashing an airplane into one of these buildings. Now, sir, e even, with, even with a gun to their head, they wouldn't do that. I was thinking exactly the same thing, that it is unimaginable to me, at least, that any pilot, no matter the circumstance, uh, would have followed that order, crashed that plane into this building or that building. I don't know what they would have done, how they'd have dealt with it, but it, it's, it is unimaginable they would have followed that order. So you've got people that not only are willing to uh, give up their lives for just a horrendously, in my view, stupid, cowardly act, but are sophisticated enough to fly a modern jet plane. It was described by Secretary of State Schultz, and I don't know if you heard it, as an act of war against the United States. Do you see this as an act of war? I think it's clearly an act of war. I think it's, uh, in many ways, it's a different time, but it's, it's everything that Pearl Harbor was and more. Uh, it just puts uh, an exclamation point next to this dangerous world we live in. And the inability to appease people that are this demented uh, with rhetoric. Uh, it hasn't worked. It's not going to work. Uh, we can see what happened today. All peace-loving people of the world, all people that believe in democracy and freedom uh, need to stand against this. Any country that harbors or aids this type of activity anywhere in the world needs to declare which side they're on. And we need to seriously do something about this. And I believe we will. Mr. Kellstrom, thank you uh, for joining us uh, to Washington and our colleague, Judy Woodruff. Judy. Aaron, uh, I, uh, again, listening to your conversation with uh, James Kellstrom and the others, it's, uh, uh, we, can, uh, we can only begin to grasp the magnitude of what's happened here. Uh, and I, I keep uh, thinking back to what your New York City Mayor Rudy Giuliani said about what, 30 minutes ago. He looked at the camera and he said, uh, it's safe here in New York City. Everything is safe. But I would just say, without contradicting the mayor at all, that for so many people watching these pictures, it's very hard to believe or to know what is safe after four commercial jetliners uh, uh, caused uh, the deaths uh, that we have seen uh, today. Uh, we have right now, we want to show you some pictures, some uh, conversations with people on the street, the streets of New York City this morning, about the time of the, the uh, airplane crashes into the, into the World Trade Center. Let's listen. The actual airplane hitting the building. It was surreal. As we looked at it, we thought it was something out of a, out of a movie. It, it just didn't seem real. The airplane just came in at its tilt. We heard the scream of the plane, then a crack, 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 boom, 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 and the, the plane just disappeared. You didn't see the plane anymore. 
and then you sort of blow out from the other side. A lot of people equate this to something like Pearl Harbor. You, know, you were there, you saw this. Put yourself in the perspective that this is, this is a, a, you know, nothing's ever happened like this. Well, I now have images that will never leave my mind. As, I, as I'm walking up from, uh, we walk down from downtown up to Grand Central here, and I just keep seeing that airplane hitting. I saw also prior to the second airplane hitting while we were still standing there, I must have saw about seven or eight bodies flying through the air coming from 80 floors up. Just they'd fall from the from the the debris, and you just saw them cartwheeling down, bouncing off the building. It was it was devastating. I'm not an emotional person in the least, and I actually felt tremendous emotion at that point because I do have a lot of friends in both buildings, and I do know that last time, as I said, it took two and a half hours for somebody on the 70th floor to get out of that building. It's ab absolutely devastating. There's, I believe, being down there, is tens of thousands of people dead. That's what I believe at this point. So you're not an emotional person. I see I, I'm not emotional, at least, and now I'm very emotional about this. I have feelings of revenge, but I just sure hope that the government does doesn't doesn't arbitrarily select an enemy and decide to, for political reasons, uh, obliterate that enemy just for this. But I do hope they find the, the people that are responsible for this. And exactly. fell and just hit yes, blew, yes, and, yes, and just blew out the plaza we were on. No, it was complete dark, complete dark. There is no light. So since God, somebody with little light came up because we couldn't even see what's happening. We all, you know, with dust and debris and. How did you get out? Well, the firefighter, somebody with little light came eventually, and we were following him. And go to. What did you do? I'm he, sorry. He, the police officer told everybody to form a human chain, and we held on to each other, and he flashed the light, and he directed us to building five, and we went out building five. Did you see people bleeding, and what, what did you see? Oh, everybody could see. Do you want blood? Here's blood. Everybody's bleeding. People are laying all over the floor. It's horrible. And I was there the first time, and this is twice. CNN uh, producer Rose Arce on the streets of New York. She's joining us by telephone. Rose, can you hear me? Yes, I can, Judy. What are you seeing? Tell us where you are. I am about two blocks north of, of where the World Trade Center used to, used to be standing, and I'm surrounded by firefighters who are just watching helplessly. They've had to, to suspend their rescue operation, and they're just watching a burning hulk of building right now. The, uh, the front part of the World Trade Center has completely sheared off, as well as many of the upper floors. And every few minutes you'll hear like a small sort of a rumbling sound, almost like an explosion sound, and another chunk of it will come flying down into the street, um, creating a situation where rescue personnel just have not been able to get close to this building now for over an hour. Rose, how close are they to the building? I'd say the closest people are, are probably about two blocks north of there, just, just in front of where I am. I, I spoke to a firefighter a few minutes ago that said that he had had to stand there and watch helplessly as at least a dozen people leapt from the upper floors of this building during a, during a fire. Rose, when, when the mayor was asked this question at a news conference a little while ago, he said he wasn't able to answer, but given your vantage point, can you tell how large a perimeter, how many square blocks are we talking about that, that's been devastated? Well, I'd say that it, at least, uh, you know, f up to four blocks north, really five blocks north of the World Trade Center, there is debris on top of buildings. There are buildings that have been pierced by debris. The streets are covered with, with several inches of soot and, and literally pieces of people's desks. You know, there's office supplies. You know, where I'm standing right now, I can see there's, there's letters on the floor. There's, there's one woman's resume. There's some insurance papers. You know, things that clearly came from inside that building. And, Rose, where, again, you are how close to what's going on here? I'm about, uh, I'd say, about two and a half blocks north of the World Trade Center. And are you still seeing victims uh, injured being taken away or walking away? or is No, that right now there's absolutely nobody that's getting near anywhere close to that building. There's just a huge and enormous pieces of debris just falling one right after the other. And I, as I said, firefighters just, a lot of them are just standing here helpless, you know, wanting to go in and try to fight the fire, but just can't get any closer for, because of safety problems. And, uh, and, Rose, is your sense that there are enough emergency personnel there once they can? I mean, are there, give us a sense of, of how many emergency personnel you see. There, there's an absolute, a small army of uh, fire safety people. I mean, I even see immigration and naturalization service officers, federal marshals. You know, there are trucks from all over New York. I, you know, I see license plates, New Jersey, 
people from upstate New York. There's just a small army of people here, but there's just really not a whole lot that they can do for you know, whoever may be left right now because it is just such a dangerous situation. CNN producer Rose Arce, uh, she's talking to us right now. She's uh, a few blocks away from the World Trade Center describing efforts by, by rescue personnel who just cannot get close because it is still a very dangerous situation. You heard her say large pieces of debris still coming down. And these pictures we're showing you, all of them taken earlier in the day since the first uh, airplane hit the World Trade Center about 8.48 this morning. And again, these are those still pictures that Aaron first referred to a few minutes ago, still pictures of a commercial jetliner. This was the second one to come in. This was the plane, uh, the um, uh, United Airlines Flight 175 uh, that uh, we now know has to be the one that Boeing 767 bound from Boston to Los Angeles. Instead, it ended up inside and going through uh, incomprehensibly one of the towers of the World Trade Center. Just about a block and a half away here in Washington, a block and a half away from the White House, CNN senior White House correspondent John King. John, you were not traveling, of course, with President Bush, who went to Florida yesterday, but you have been talking to a number of people around the president who are trying to stay on top of what's happened. Trying to stay on top, top of what has happened, Judy, despite the fact that from the ground up anyway, the White House complex, which you see behind me, the building itself and the old executive office building, which is home to a number of senior administration officials, a virtual ghost town, evacuated this morning. The president, as we have reported, is now at a military installation in the Midwest. The president, first from Florida, stopped at a military installation in Louisiana. He was briefed. Then there was talk that he would come back to Washington, and administration officials saying they believe that is politically very important to send a signal to get the president Which back to the point? White House as soon as possible. But the president instead stopped at a second military installation in Nebraska. We are told he is participating in a National Security Council meeting by telephone. Vice President Dick Cheney has been in the White House, underground in the White House Operations Center, the Situation Room, which is a fortified command and control structure throughout the day with other national security officials receiving information from around the country and directing U.S. operations from there. We do know on Air Force One en route from Louisiana to the Midwest, the president spoke to the mayor of New York and the governor of New York. He's been in constant contact with officials back here, including members of the congressional leadership who also have been asked by their security to go to a secure bunker area built for just such a situation, a national security emergency in the United States, the leaders of Congress taken as well to a secure location. Again, the White House grounds were evacuated when all this was taking place this morning from this perch up here, which you are familiar with from anchoring inside politics. You can still see smoke wafting up from the Pentagon and National Airport across the Potomac River, usually one of the nation's busiest, of course, now completely shut down as part of the security precautions being taken here. We are told there is a priority on trying to get the president back to the White House, but priority number one is the president's security. And I've spoken to several senior administration officials as well as some security sources who say at this moment they know of no specific additional threats, but of course they were caught so completely off guard this morning, extra precautions being taken because of the scope of these devastating terrorist attacks. Judy? All right, John King uh, at a uh, location on top of an office building just a few blocks from the White House, as you can see, reporting uh, on the scene there where every federal building in the city of Washington has been evacuated. Joining us now on the telephone, former Georgia United States Senator Sam Nunn. Senator Nunn, uh, are you in Atlanta, New York? Judy, I'm in Wilmington, Delaware. All right. Senator, longtime uh, uh, leader of uh, the Senate Armed Services Committee, someone who has followed uh, military affairs in this country for, for so long. Um, what are you thinking right now? First, it was certainly a day of hate terms of what uh, was perpetrated by whoever did this, and, and second, a day of sorrow for the people who are the victims and their families, and it uh, certainly was a cruel and heartless uh, and monstrous type attack. I think it's very important that we are steadfast in this country. We always rise to the occasion and work together when we're in a crisis, and I think this qualifies for uh, mustering the American will 
to remain calm and collected and determined and firm, but uh, most of all, solidarity here at home with the president, uh, following his lead with the governors, with mayors, with the people on the scene, the front lines, the firemen and the policemen and the medical personnel and the nurses and the doctors, people we take for granted every day, but uh, God bless them, and we need to be with them and behind them and help them in every way we can. Certainly, we need to learn lessons from this. We need to find out uh, about the intelligence, find out uh, why we didn't uh, get some notification, whether we had information that we uh, did not properly analyze, or whether well, Senator, all of those things come to mind. Senator, I want to ask you about that, because there has to be many people out there watching who feel betrayed, who feel, who want to know why is it that something, how is it that something on this scale could be carried off when they thought the United States was the safest country on the, on the earth? Judy, I think that's a good question, and I think our intelligence people uh, have to uh, be asked those hard questions, and they will be. I think we also need to put it in perspective, though. We've had efforts against America for the last 20, 25 years, some of them uh, uh, almost of this magnitude in terms of the planning, and they've been warded off by law enforcement and intelligence. So we have to put it in somewhat uh, perspective, and we have to also understand some of our other nations in the world have been under... Uh, not exactly this kind of attack, but similar type uh, terrorism for a long time, including Great Britain, including uh, Israel and uh, the Middle East, including uh, Germany. Uh, so we we have to understand that uh, America is an open society, and we are vulnerable to this, and we need to do everything we can to tell the people of the world that we expect them to be solid with us, too, because we need uh, world condemnation here. Uh, certainly when we find out who did it, we need to retaliate and we need to uh, demand that the world stand solid with us in condemning any country that houses or supports terrorism. All right, uh, former United States Senator Sam Nunn, Democrat of Georgia, joining us on the telephone, longtime leader of the Senate uh, Armed Services Committee and certainly a leader in U.S. military affairs. Speaking of military leaders, we have now joining us live from Little Rock, Arkansas, former NATO Commander General Wesley Clark. And General Clark, you and I talked a little bit earlier today about what's happened. I know you have sources. Have you learned any more about uh, either, we've obviously been looking at pictures of the horrific evidence of what happened, but have you learned any more about suspicions, information, about what might have been behind this? Well, actually, I know that there will be a great deal of effort underway to find out who could have contributed to this. And there are uh, various groups who could have been part of it. These groups often change their names. They have interlocking memberships, and so it will take time to run this down. But I think it's clear now, uh, with the hindsight of a few hours, that how well coordinated this attack was, that it was launched from multiple airports, that it picked aircraft that had the largest possible fuel loads to increase their explosive capacity, that the people who were involved knew how to take over aircraft and fly them into the targets. And uh, clearly they had some idea of uh, the symbols of American power that they, they wanted to strike. And so uh, I, th I think we've got to allow some time to, uh, for our military to, to, to work through this. I am reassured in talking to people inside the Pentagon that the command and control system in there is totally intact. Uh, all of the men and women who were part of that command and control system are at their stations and have been throughout this. And, and so uh, it's very smooth and very effective. Yeah. Uh, I'm thinking about all those people who were in that part of the Pentagon that was struck by the aircraft. We know there are a number of men and women who served there who aren't accounted for, and presumably there are casualties and fatalities there. But the command and control functions are totally intact. But, 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 General Clark, what do you say to Americans, and this is the same uh, version of the question I just put to Senator Nunn, who would say, we thought we lived in the safest country on earth, and now we find out that uh, places that we thought were invulnerable, the Pentagon of all places, the, one of the most secure locations in, the, in Washington, much less in the country, uh, the, the Twin Towers of the Trade Center, a building that had already come under terrorist attack and had been under increased security to know that these kinds of places, and we've been told, uh, at least I'm, I'm informed that Senator Orrin Hatch has said 
to some of my colleagues at CNN, there was an indication that Camp David may have been a target of the uh, jetliner that crashed in, uh, in Pennsylvania. This is the sort of thing that makes people want to reevaluate everything. Well, I, I've heard the same rumor about Camp David, but we know that for all of our unique power in the world today, the United States is also uniquely vulnerable. We've been targeted for years by a number of these groups, and many people have warned for some time that there's really no ultimate protection against terrorism, and particularly international terrorism. There's no telling how many of these efforts that are similar or perhaps lesser in scale have been broken up by the United States or by our allies, and yet this one has succeeded, and I know there'll be some hard questions asked. But Judy, one thing that comes through very clearly in this is that in an era where global communications are the way they are, and there's movement of people and ideas and communications, that it's not possible to have only one nation deal with the problem of international terrorism. Greater international cooperation and coordination is required. And certainly, no state should be supporting and sponsoring the presence inside its borders or the activities out of its borders of international terrorists. And that's one very important message that comes from this terrible tragedy. And, I, and I'm sure our government will drive this home very strongly in all of the international fora. I was just on the phone with people in Europe, and as you probably know, NATO headquarters has responded by ordering the evacuation. Of course, by the North Atlantic Charter, an attack on one member of NATO is an attack on all of NATO. And how this will play itself out in coordination with our allies remains to be seen. But here's clearly an area where the United States desperately does need the support of all of our allies. And I'm sure we'll have that support as we deal with the consequences of this tragedy. General Wesley Clark, a former NATO commander, joining us from Little Rock, Arkansas. General, thank you for joining us once again today. Thank you, Judy. Thank you. Aaron in New York City. Judy, there was something absolutely chilling as General Clark walked through the planning that must have taken place, the, the, the planes that were picked, the reasons that they, those planes were selected is absolutely chilling. CNN's Mike Hanna in our bureau in Israel joins us now. Uh, whenever something like this happens, I, I guess the, you, you look to the Middle East. Mike, what's the situation in Israel now? Well, Aaron, in an area that has been racked by violence by nearly a year, all have been closely watching events as they've unfolded in the United States. There has been a blanket condemnation from all leaders in the region of the events that have taken place there and commiseration about the extensive loss of life that has occurred. However, when news of the events uh, started to filter through in Palestinian areas, there were sporadic incidents of celebration in the streets in um, the East Jerusalem and in various parts of the West Bank. Uh, Palestinians uh, took to the streets in small groups uh, celebrating what they said was an attack against the United States. The United States blamed by some Palestinians for its ongoing support as it is seen of Israel in this uh, conflict, in this Middle Eastern conflict. However, while some Palestinians were taking to the streets in apparent celebration, one youth was quoted as saying as he received a sweet, sweets handed around in celebration, this is a sweet from Osama bin Laden, he said. However, while this was happening, the Palestinian leadership itself was very uh, uh, quick to condemn the events in the strongest of terms. First of all, I am offering my con condolences, the condolences of uh, the Palestinian people to the, uh, to the American President, President Bush, to his government, to the American people for this terrible act. We are completely shocked, completely shocked. Unbelievable. Condemnation and commiserations too from Israel in messages to the United States administration. Israel has banned all non El Al flights coming into the country as a security precaution, and certainly the events in the U.S. being watched very, very closely from this region, Aaron. 
Uh, Mike, uh, just a couple of things briefly. One is it is hard, I, I suspect, for many of our viewers to look at the tape of the celebration in, uh, that, we, that you just showed us and contrast it, contrast those scenes with what we have seen from here in New York and in Washington. The utter devastation, the fear on people's faces, the death and injuries that we know have taken place. The contrasting pictures are extraordinary. Is the Israeli military on a high state of alert now? Yes, very much so. There is a high state of alert uh, throughout this area. The context that one must view those demonstrations in, um, those celebrations as we've seen in Palestinian streets, is a context of an area in which violence has been ongoing for nearly 12 months. The context, too, that some Palestinians have uh, criticized the United States sharply for what is seen as its support of Israel in this ongoing conflict. And certainly the Palestinian leadership has been very quick to disassociate itself from those images on the ground, making quite close, uh, clear that it condemns uh, in the strongest of terms the events in the United States. All radical Palestinian groups too have disassociated themselves and denied any responsibility for the United States attacks. Aaron? Mike, thank you. CNN's Mike Hanna, our Jerusalem bureau chief, uh, where it's about quarter to 11 uh, in Israel, about quarter to four here in New York. Um, hospitals here uh, continue to be inundated with the injured, uh, the most serious of the injured being treated first in a classic triage operation. Maria Hinojosa is at St. Vincent Hospital. She joins us on the phone. Maria, what are you seeing and what are you hearing? Well, Aaron, uh, since about uh, 10 o'clock this morning, there's been a steady uh, stream of ambulances coming into St. Vincent's, which is the central area, uh, central hospital for the traumatized, where they're dealing with the trauma unit here. Now, what we've seen, the most recent numbers now, there's 256 patients. 25 of them are in critical condition. Three of them have passed away, and about 30 firefighters and police have also been treated. Just to give you an idea of the numbers, this hospital handled the World Trade Center bombing in 1993. There they saw a total of only 160 patients. They are now having well surpassed that by 100, 100 patients, more or less, 256 patients now. Mayor Giuliani arrived here about five minutes ago. And he went straight inside. We're expecting him to come out and address the media here. And essentially, there's a sea of green. Uh, office chairs have been uh, draped with white sheets to be used uh, instead of stretchers. Uh, buses have been ferrying hundreds of volunteers who have come to donate blood. They've been taken to uh, other locations. And uh, just about two minutes ago, we saw another busload um, carrying doctors and nurses who have come off. Lots of doctors and nurses coming to St. Vincent's wanting to volunteer. People here saying that they're um, asking them to come later tonight where they're expected to uh, be receiving patients well, well into the night for the next 24 hours at least. Aaron? Maria, thank you. Um, a snapshot of what is going on in uh, any number of hospitals here in the city of New York and in the New York region, um, in, the, in the counties surrounding New York. This is all being uh, played out in very much the same way. Another snapshot, if you will. CNN producer Alec Murin is in a car in New Jersey trying to make uh, his way to us here in, in the city. Uh, Alec, can you hear me? I, I can, Aaron. Tell me what. Tell me what is out there right now. How far are you from Manhattan? Well, I'm in. Uh, I've been traveling from suburban, uh, suburban Maryland today, trying to come up, like you said, to assist in the coverage. And it's it's eerie how uh, these events are impacting travel all along the Northeast Corridor. Uh, as you know, a very busy um, commuter area. Went to the uh, train station in Baltimore this morning. The trains have just been canceled. People were uh, forming carpools to get where they needed to go. Um, as I jumped in my car and headed north on uh, Interstate 95 and then on to uh, the New Jersey Turnpike, uh, lots of signs, um, serious problems avoid New York. On the New Jersey Turnpike, uh, I don't know if this is unprecedented, but it's certainly uh, unusual. Everyone was funneled off of the Turnpike uh, at exit 11, which is Perth Amboy. Uh, ironically, as you get off there, you could see the cloud of smoke still billowing out of the World Trade Center. Um, lots of people uh, have just pulled over to the side of the road and are sort of sitting there. Uh, some have gotten binoculars from who knows where. Um, 
I talked to a few of them. They said they didn't know where they were going to go because the uh, turnpike was closed. I just got here to the train station uh, because reports had been that uh, perhaps train service was starting up again. Uh, in fact, it is starting, uh, leaving the city, and they made that announcement, uh, which was greeted by um, yeah, my smiles and, and, yeah. and quiet, uh, quiet nods of the head from people who are clearly waiting for loved ones to come out of New York City. But uh, there's still no service into New York City, and uh, the island remains uh, pretty much an island. I talked to Alec, Woodbridge. Uh, Alec, let me, let me, Alec, let me stop you there. Uh, thank you for the snapshot. Keep working your way here. We could use the help. Uh, Judy Woodruff in Washington. Judy, what do you got? Aaron, uh, joining us now, our congressional correspondent, Kate Snow, for an update on uh, what some members of Congress have we doing, been doing. We know they've been evacuated from the Capitol building, but uh, Kate, you've been learning uh, about uh, uh, some of their assessment of what's, uh, what's happened. I'm sorry, uh, we don't have that audio connection with Kate. I can report that uh, uh, sources are telling CNN's national security correspondent David Ensor uh, that there are, quote, good indications that people with links to the Osama bin Laden organization are responsible for today's attacks. Uh, we can't do much better right now at identifying these sources, but again, they're saying good indications. And this is, again, no proof, but this is very much in line with what high-ranking uh, people have been telling us throughout this day, all the way from former NATO, uh, uh, NATO commander Wesley Clark, General Wesley Clark, told us uh, hours ago, and then again, uh, just a few moments ago, he, we spoke with him just a few moments ago, he said that uh, there are very few organizations that would have the sophistication, the financial resources, the organization, the network of contacts to carry out an attack this sophisticated, this organized, where you have uh, planes hitting these key locations in, the United, in New York City and Washington, the Pentagon, within just minutes of one another. Uh, people who could take over the cockpit of an airplane and uh, presumably push the pilot aside. We can't imagine that any pilot would knowingly uh, fly an airplane into the Pentagon or into any, any uh, place where there were people. Uh, that Some of these terror people with connections to the terrorist organizations must have been at the cockpit. Joining us uh, now, and I believe he is in a studio, George Terwilliger, uh, who has um, had a career of uh, following the activities of intelligence organization, has become an expert on terrorist activities. I'm sorry, we're not going to go to George Terwilliger. We're going to go to White House uh, spokeswoman, yes, counselor, counselor Karen Hughes President Bush. in Omaha. And I'm here to update you all on the activities of the federal government in response to this morning's attacks on our country. As you heard from President Bush a short time ago, the federal government is acting to help local communities with search and rescue and emergency management operations, to take all appropriate precautions to protect our citizens, and to identify those responsible for these despicable attacks on the American people. While some federal buildings have been evacuated for security reasons and to protect our workers, your federal government continues to function effectively. We have a federal emergency response plan, and at President Bush's direction, we are implementing it. We began to implement it immediately after the first attack in New York this morning. We contacted American forces and embassies throughout the world and place them on high alert. The United States Secret Service immediately secured the President, the Vice President, and the Speaker of the House, and they are all safe. They have also secured members of the National Security Team, the President's Cabinet, and senior staff. As you know, President Bush was in Sarasota, Florida when the first attack occurred this morning. Air Force One has now landed at Offutt Air Force Base in Omaha, Nebraska, and the President is in a secure location. He is in continuous communication with the Vice President and key members of his Cabinet and National Security Team. 
Vice President Cheney and our National Security Advisor Condoleezza Rice are in a secure facility at the White House. I have just come from there. The Secretary of Transportation and other members of our White House senior staff are gathered at a command center there, and we are coordinating with other branches of our federal government. The Secretary of Defense remains at the Pentagon, and the Secretary of State is en route back to Washington from his trip to South America. President Bush is conducting a meeting of the National Security Council as we speak. They are meeting President Bush from his location and other members from different locations in Washington and other locations. As many of you have been reporting, the Federal Aviation Administration ordered all airports closed and all planes which were in the air were directed to land at the nearest airport. International flights were diverted to alternate locations outside of the United States. Transportation Secretary Mineta has directed the Federal Aviation Administration to suspend operations until at least noon tomorrow. So no airline flights will operate until at least then and until the FAA announces that operations will be resumed. Secretary Mineta has also issued orders controlling the movement of all vessels in United States navigable waters. The Federal Emergency Management Agency has activated eight urban search and rescue task forces in New York, and four of these highly trained teams are at work here in Washington at the Pentagon. Every federal agency has implemented continuity of operations plans to make sure the government continues to function effectively. While the markets closed today because of the situation in Manhattan, the United States financial system has continued to operate. Banks have been open all day. The Federal Reserve has operated regularly and continuously. The Department of Health and Human Services has mobilized medical personnel and supplies to provide help to local authorities who are working so diligently to respond and try to help the victims of these terrible attacks. President Bush has committed the full resources of our intelligence and law enforcement communities to identify and bring to swift justice those responsible for these despicable attacks. The Department of Justice is setting up a hotline for families who fear that their relatives may have been victims of one of these attacks, and we will be announcing that telephone number shortly. Our fellow citizens and our freedom came under attack today, and no one should doubt America's resolve. President Bush and all our country's leaders thank the many Americans who are helping with rescue and relief efforts. We ask our fellow Americans for your prayers for the victims, for their families, for the rescue workers, and for our country. Thank you all very much, and we will continue to update you as information is available and confirmed. President uh, Counselor, Presidential Counselor Karen Hughes uh, at the in Washington, D.C., at the headquarters of the FBI, talking to reporters, and very unusual. She did not take questions, which normally would be the case uh, uh, for, uh, for someone speaking in a, in a spokesperson's capacity. But what we heard from Ms. Hughes is that uh, all pr appropriate precautions are being taken. She said the president is in a secure location, the vice president, and is in continuous contact, she said, with Vice President Cheney. She mentioned again that uh, Secretary of Defense Donald Rumsfeld uh, is at the Pentagon. Secretary of State Powell, she said, at an undisclosed location. She said uh, she went through, uh, ticked off a list of measures that have been taken to, uh, to assure that the federal government of this country continues to operate. She said a plan was put in place after the first attack on the World Trade Center this morning, and uh, she said it has been in operation ever since. In an effort to be reassuring, she said on high alert, the United States forces were put on high alert, American embassies abroad, the same thing. She said uh, not just the president and the vice president, but also uh, when, you, when you think about the succession uh, to the presidency, uh, the Speaker of the House 
would be third in line after, or second in line after the vice president. She said the Speaker of the House, Dennis Hastert, has also been put in a safe, or taken to a safe, but undisclosed location. CNN's senior White House correspondent John King at a location uh, since the White House was mainly evacuated about a block away. John? Well, Judy, Karen Hughes working yes. throughout the day in the White House Situation Room in the basement of the White House had a fortified structure. A great deal during the day. It's going to last for a number of days. We told the president that uh, we thought that uh, the whole rescue effort would take you know, a week or so or more. Uh, but the main, main focus right now, obviously, is on saving as many lives as possible. I think it's still possible for us to save a lot of the people that are there. They're not all there. <laughs> all of our police and firefighters are not there. We have a lot of police and firefighters. Yeah, Bernie, do you want to explain where the police and firefighters are? Do we have a death call there? No, no, we no, don't. No, we, we do not. And we're not going to put one out until much later, after we get a better sense of the numbers the, we're talking about. The police and uh, the police deployment is, uh, you know, primary focus is down in southern Manhattan uh, in the rescue effort. But uh, we're tending to our policing needs all over the city. Uh, we, as the mayor said earlier, uh, we're getting assistance from the governor and the National Guard. Uh, about 200 National Guardsmen, about uh, two hours, about an hour ago, I guess. There'll be another about 1,500 sometime this evening to come in to, uh, to help us. And we're going to continue on the rescue efforts, but uh, policing will go on in the rest of the city as usual. For other possible actions, how, how is that Obviously, we're in a high state of alert. Um, we're looking at other government buildings, uh, securing those buildings, securing other areas in the city. Uh, right now, our primary focus and our, our efforts are in southern Manhattan. Just one more, please. I, I don't think anybody. Uh, the, the mayor and I were there this morning. Uh, I was there when the second plane hit the building. I was right underneath the building. Uh, I don't think anybody would have imagined that one of those airliners would have hit, hit the building like that. Nobody in their, in their right mind would have thought that would happen. So, and, it's, and in this circumstance, it was something we couldn't avoid. Uh, we couldn't have stopped, even if we tried. Uh, so. Thank you. Thank you. We've been listening to uh, Mayor Rudy Giuliani, obviously fairly close to the site uh, where the rescue operations are underway in New York City, reassuring that every effort's being made to get as many people out uh, and uh, to hospitals as they possibly can. Now, back here in Washington, let's return to our senior White House correspondent, John King. John, and let's talk about what the White House is doing, and some of which we heard about from Karen Hughes, who's a counselor to the president just a minute ago. Well, Judy, some of this involves security precautions, which is one of the reasons the president is not yet back in Washington. He is now in Nebraska at a military air base conducting a National Security Council meeting, although at the White House they are putting a priority to getting him back as soon as possible. They believe that picture of the president returning to the White House would send a powerful signal. You heard both Karen Hughes here in Washington, Mayor Giuliani just again in New York, trying to reassure the citizens that the government is at work despite these atrocities today. They very much want to get the president back. Now, from an operational standpoint, the vice president and the national security advisor, Condoleezza Rice, are in the situation room in the basement of the White House. That is the command and control system used for natural disasters, used for terrorist attacks like this one, used in the case of major military operations. That has been up and running throughout the day. The senior staff at the White House operating out of that. Ms. Hughes on the one hand trying to send reassuring signals saying the government was up and running. The financial systems were up and running. Yet on the other hand she too noted the remarkable paralysis this event, these are terrorist attacks have caused in the United States. Commercial air systems shut down nationwide at least through noon tomorrow. Security officials still not confident enough to bring the president back to Washington. So Karen Hughes delivering a statement, bringing us up to date on the activities and the movements of the president and the vice president, at the same time saying the United States government still looking into who is responsible for this. And I know David Enser is standing by with more information. White House officials saying their early indications are that they believe, and David may have more information, that this, these attacks are linked to the suspected terrorist Osama bin Laden. Judy. All right, John, uh, you are right. David Ensor, our, our national security correspondent here in the studio in Washington. David, I know you've been on the telephone. What have you been able to learn? U.S. officials are saying that they now have new and specific information 
uh, and they say this information is uh, good indications that people with links to Osama bin Laden may have been responsible for these attacks. Uh, I asked, is this new information that's uh, come in since the attacks? Yes, it is. Is it specific in nature? Yes, it is. Uh, now, they're not completely eliminating the possibility that the attacks could have come from somewhere else, uh, not ruling out a Saddam Hussein-inspired attack or some kind of combination of Palestinian groups or some other combination. But good indications that people with links to bin Laden may have been behind the attack. And this is new and specific information, the officials say. They are also expressing uh, a certain amount of what I think is best described as anger uh, at the uh